So raise your hand if you have been glued to the, to the television these last 10 days watching footage of the floods in Texas. Oh, come on. I know it's more than that, okay? This is something that most of us just can't, can't get away from. And it just it looks so um, unbelievable, especially when they put the pictures side by side of what it looked before the rain and then how it looked afterwards. One of the images that um, just broke my heart was of a missing family. Grandparents with their grandchildren were in a van, in a minivan, and were swept away by the waters, and they were missing. And once the waters receded, they found the van with the family inside. To think of uh, those grandparents with the grandchildren, I have to tell you, just broke my heart. And I, I can't look at the footage anymore. I just, I can't. But I have to tell you that it has created the inspiration for today's sermon. So I want you to join me in prayer. May the words from my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace be with you on this day. So, I'm generally a good driver. It all depends who you talk to. But I, I really do believe I'm a good driver, especially when I am in a good and happy mood. When I have no stress whatsoever. I drive and observe every law that there is. And, and I know that you've only seen me as a happy-go-lucky person. But the one thing that changes my driving is when I'm in a bad mood or when I'm stressed out. Like most people, when I have stress, it affects my driving. And I have to confess, it is not as good as, as I would like for it to be. Not too long ago, as I was driving over the Bayway, I went ahead and started to listen to National Public Radio. And it was 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, you get the voice of Kai Rizdal and marketplace. Now you know Kai Rizdal. Kai Rizdal is that guy who sounds like he's about to say a joke, but then he goes into the markets and the news of the markets and domestic and abroad. And um, it, it always sounds like he's on the verge of saying something that is funny, and, but then of course there's nothing funny about the market. Well on this particular segment, he brought in a guest from the flood insurance program. And they started to interview this uh, individual, and he said that as early as 1994, government, government officials in the state of Texas and in the city of Houston knew that flooding in Houston would reach biblical proportions. That was 23 years ago. In the report, it said that if Houston did not stop, expanding out into the floodplains. If they didn't create zoning regulations that would stop the expansions into the floodplains, that they would experience these biblical floods. And should they continue to expand into the floodplains, that they should go ahead and elevate the communities and elevate the homes. When I heard the segment, I have to tell you that I turned off the radio. I was in danger of losing my temper and becoming a bad driver. I have to confess that I find myself not listening to the news as much as I used to. There's so much about the news that just completely uh, gives me just the, the wrong feeling that I don't want to have. I do not always want to be in a bad mood because of the failings of government or because of the mediocrity of our systems. And because most importantly, it's always pushing me to bad driving. And I know that if I ever get caught, it's a defense that I cannot use in traffic court. I know the judge will not care what my mood is in, right? To hear that government had an opportunity to ensure the safety of the Houston residents and instead turned a blind eye is infuriating. Now people are blaming the flood on Hurricane Harvey, but the loss of life and the loss of property, I think that is a loss that we need to uh, take a look at a little bit more carefully. A lot of the literature I'm reading, and it's literature that has been uh, put out there by all the relief organizations, is that this is a flood of, 
uh, such magnitude that it's historic. And it requires giving from the people and from the community of faith in, in a uh, proportionate manner. That never before have we seen something like this, and so consequently, everybody must chip in. But I've got to tell you that as much as we're chipping in, as much as we are uh, making sure that there is relief on the way for everybody, I think we need to examine something else. I think we need to examine how this happened and how each and every one of us contributed towards it. If this is a historic flood, then we need to take a look at ways of preventing it so that it doesn't happen again. So that we don't have grandparents with grandchildren ending up at the bottom of a river. We need to examine our government, government officials, elected officials, but the citizenry, you and I, those who put them there. We need to hold them accountable because that's ultimately the job of being a good citizen. A good citizen goes to town hall meetings. A good citizen reads the news and finds out what is happening. And a good citizen holds the elected officials accountable. I'll tell you that not too long ago I went to a local St. Pete uh, gathering of, of elected officials, city council, and our mayor was there. And this was around the time of the sewage spill and how the sewage spill had completely ruined our ecosystem and people who were uh, getting wet in the bay were at danger of becoming very, very sick. Now, I went there because I was new to this community, new to this church, and I kind of wanted to figure out what was happening. And it was truly an inst uh, a good lesson on, on civics. It was a good lesson on how to be a citizen and how members of city council and, and from our mayor's office and from all the different agencies were being held accountable for that sewage spill. I think a flood of this magnitude deserves the same. It deserves the same attention. We must take a look at how is it that not just elected officials in years past and in years current have allowed for poor zoning in the state of Texas. But we have to take a look at what is it that the citizens were doing or not doing that allowed for this to happen. And we have to take a look at the church. The church is a part of the community. The church is a part of the organizing community. How is the church uh, a, a part of those conversations? Do we even show up when those conversations are being held? Now, churches around the nation are all pitching in to help the people of Texas. Loss of this magnitude has mobilized churches to give blankets and hot plates of food. And I have to tell you, we are becoming experts. We are becoming so good at providing this sort of relief every time there is a disaster that it kind of makes you wonder why is it that the church has gotten so good in this charitable act? What is it that's happening that the church is always stepping forward and giving this needed charity when it's most needed? And I'm glad, I'm glad that we are. I'm glad that there are instrumentalities within our own denomination that are already on the ground. They're already there getting things going. But what's happening is that this is the only thing we're known for. This is the only thing that defines us now as a church, is the ability to hand out a blanket and serve a hot plate of food. Isn't the church more than just a blanket and a hot plate of food? Isn't the church supposed to fulfill other roles as well? I have to tell you that it is at moments like this that I question the voice of the church. Have we spoken up and have we spoken up at the right place, in front of the right audience, enough times to make sure that we're making a difference so that grandparents don't end up with their grandchildren at the bottom of the river. Handing out blankets and hot plate of food is fine and dandy, but we need to do more. We need to speak up. Because if it can happen in Houston, it can happen in other cities. And it may not be the same kind of disaster, but here in St. Pete, who knows exactly what the next sewage spill might do to our livelihood. I do remember that we had to turn off the water 
for those of you who were here for those two weeks, nobody was allowed to drink from the water fountains. Because if you did, you were going to catch that bacteria. Now the thing is, is that we were told to turn off the water fountains right after I drank from it. And I was like, son of a gun. You mean you're going to give me this news after I just filled my belly with this water? So I was praying that all the hot food I was going to eat that day, all those jalapeno peppers were going to kill the bacteria. <laughs> but I have to tell you that the voice of the church is actually something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. There's a lot of people who want to keep the church as purely a provider of blankets and hot plates of food. They don't want the church to step into a prophetic role and start, and start speaking up at different town hall gatherings and so forth. And this is where today's scripture passage from the Gospel of Matthew is so pertinent. Today's Gospel has Jesus reprimanding Peter. And it, you got to think, what is it that Peter said that deserved such a strong reprimand? Get away from me, Satan. Okay, I mean, those are harsh, harsh words. And if you think about what is it that Peter was doing, he was really just expressing love. He was like, I love you. Let's, let's avoid this thing that's going to happen in Jerusalem. Let's do all that we possibly can to not have this happen to you. The problem is that Peter missed the point. The mission of Jesus was not one of avoidance. The mission of Jesus was much larger than his own comfort and longevity. Now, I'm sure that they could have uh, argued for Jesus to stay there in the Sea of Galilee and not go down to Jerusalem. I'm sure they could have argued for him to stay and let's set up a shop here. We'll call it Healings or Us. And, and people will come from near and far for a healing. And you won't have to lift another finger in your life because, you know, you'll be taken care of all along. And most importantly, we're not going to get in trouble. Nobody in Jerusalem will care that we're performing these miracles out in Galilee and we'll be able to live to the ripe old age of 52. Because back in those days, if you made it to 50, you were, you were ancient. But the thing is that that was not the mission of Jesus. That was not what Jesus was to do. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem and preach a message that was intimidating and was even offensive to the religious leaders of his day. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem and face those that were in power and let them know exactly what they were doing wrong. If Jesus wanted comfort, where would we be today? What would have happened? Would there even be a religion called Christianity? Our second reading was from Paul's letter to the Romans. And here we have a long list of instructions on how to live in community. And how to be in community with those whom we love and those who belong to this faith community. We rejoice with those whom we rejoice, who are rejoicing and we mourn with those who are mourning. It is to put the, the community of faith ahead of your own needs. Put the welfare of others before yours. It's a beautiful list. It is truly a beautiful list of, of things that we must do to help each other and to be there for each other and to provide for one another. And for the most part, I have to tell you, as I said earlier, I think we've got it down here at, at, at Pasigro. I think we as a community of faith could truly take a look at this list and, and say we live it. But at the very beginning of this passage, in the very, very first line, there is a word there that um, I know that we don't use too often in sermons. It's a word that we tend to stay away from. And that is the word evil. Paul says that as a community of faith, we must detest evil. And now evil is one of those words that's confusing. Evil is one of those words that... Uh, it can be taken in so many directions, and so many of us have a stereotype of what evil is. It could be, it could be the, you know, the pervert in the park. It could be the criminal. It could be the person who's just got a very, very dark soul that we see in the movies. Um, evil could be a caricature of Satan. There's so many different ways to go into evil, and I don't really want it to become 
the crux of this sermon because if not, we'll be here much longer than you have negotiated with me to. But it is there. It's part of the passage. We must detest evil. And to go ahead and just cut to the chase, I'm going to argue that evil could hide behind negligence and mediocrity. Evil, evil does not necessarily have to be in your face recognizable. It could be something that we don't notice. It could be very, very, very astutely and wisely hidden behind something else. And I'm going to focus on negligence and mediocrity because I think that is what ultimately is the largest sin that has led to the floods in Houston. We need to ask ourselves, can evil hide in such a way that we don't even recognize it? Evil is that which, I have to tell you, placed at risk the lives of grandparents traveling with their grandchildren and then called it a shame once their lives were lost. That is the kind of evil that completely drives me up the wall to the government officials who don't know how floodplains are supposed to flood, to government officials who don't know how sea levels are rising, to government officials who don't want to consider zoning regulations because of the cost or the inconvenience, I have to ask just what exactly do you think is going to happen? Just what exactly did you think was going to happen when the flood came to Houston? And nobody plans for the death of grandparents or grandchildren but good government does. Good government hopes for the best, but plans for the worst. And good citizens help their government do that. So that the church doesn't have to be a provider of blankets and hot plates of food. 30 years ago, 1988, a pastor by the name of Robert Fulgham wrote a modern day version of Paul's letter to the Romans. And I know you know about uh, this work of literature. It's called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Anybody here actually read it or you just, you just knew about it? Okay. It's a good one. Kindergarten teachers everywhere read it. I know my wife is a kindergarten teacher and uh, she's, she's got it on her shelf. 30 years ago, Robert Fulgham wrote words that are timeless. And they really overlap very nicely with Paul's letter to the Romans. For people everywhere who shy away from reading the Bible, I hope they pick up this book because the message is the same. Pogram wrote, ignorance and power and pride are a deadly mixture, you know. He's got to be from Minnesota. Don't people from Minnesota say, you know? And I'm like, ignorance, power, and pride a deadly mixture? Yes, believe me, we know. We've seen it all too often. He also wrote, it doesn't matter what you say you believe, it only matters what you do. It's actually the crux of my message last week. For those of you who are here and heard that sermon, we're talking about who do we say Jesus is, and there might be a myriad of uh, expressions of faith. What's more important is not so much your expression of faith, but how you live it. And then a list, a list that uh, I have compiled down to 12. There's obviously a book that's much longer. But Robert Fogum said everything that we learned in kindergarten, and I'm going to add that we've also taught at the church time and time again, and we will continue to teach at the church until we get it right. Number one, share everything. Number two, play fair. Pretty basic, right? Number three, don't hit people. Number four, put things back where you found them. Number five, clean up your own mess. <laughs> I'm always saying that one. Number six, don't take things that are not yours. Number seven, say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Very important to recognize that. Number eight, wash your hands before you eat, and I'm going to add and after you flush. <laughs> Number nine, live a balanced life. Learn and teach, work and play, sing and dance, cry and laugh. Number 10, my absolute favorite, take a nap every afternoon. 
I, I feel the difference when I don't, I have to tell you. Number 11, if you see your friend doing something wrong, tell him to stop. Number 12, when you go out into the world, hold hands, watch out for traffic before you cross the street and stick together. My friends, we need to build the beloved community where we hold hands and we stick together and we watch out for traffic because there's a lot of bad drivers out there stressed out. We need to build that, that beloved community for the safety of our children so that grandparents and grandchildren don't end up in such precarious situations ever again. We must build that beloved community where the church speaks up and speaks out because the church is more than just handing out blankets and hot plates of food. Amen.